Welcome back. Still with me in the studio, Bevan Jones, General Manager, London Commodity Brokers, and Craig Pfeiffer, who's the General Manager of Investments at ABSA Asset Management Private Clients. Um, we, during the break, you were just talking about how much gold India is going to be buying yeah. this, this year. Let's, let's go back on that because it's, yeah, it's mind-boggling. The expectation is 1,000 tonnes, which is like a third or a quarter of annual production. And you know, as I said, that's a lot of these private investors, and 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 that demand gets soaked up by um, the big Indian banks, and and then obviously clearing banks, etc. So it's it's a huge amount. Why is there specific demand for gold in 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 India? Well, jewelry is a big is a big. Um um, okay. element of demand for right. gold overall about half I think of the demand for gold comes from jewelry and uh, and the Indians love their jewelry and their gold jewelry weddings and yeah. the weddings they have their their wedding season you see yeah. a big peak in demand it's quite okay. seasonal and you can actually measure it you can see it wedding season drives it, it is a yeah, very oh. seasonal yeah <laughs> okay let's let's move away from from gold itself now uh, having ascertained that Generally, you're looking at about five to six percent of a portfolio that should be invo in invested in gold in some form or the other. Yeah. Um, and let's look at the other golds that are doing the rounds now. Um, the black golds, oil and coal. Mm. Mm. What's the forecast there? Well, I think you know the world population is increasing. Um, electricity is getting more and more expensive. You need coal still accounts for fifty to sixty percent of electricity generation worldwide. You can't not have electricity, um, and and oil. You can't not you know drive your car. These are these are sort of fundamental requirements now that that we need to grow our economies. Well, and you can do both of them if you really yeah, need to, but potentially, yeah. Most and, people and, don't. And, and of course, there are renewable fuels, etc., coming in. But but those are still being and, and with the economic collapse, renewable fuels are almost a bit of a luxury, really. So people have reverted back to these these base fuels. Um, and if you look at the prices there, sure, oil has come off and, and coal has come off, but to a lesser degree. But uh, nowhere near like equities have, have come off recently. So I think going forward, you've, you've now seen a floor developing and, and, and potentially we're looking at going higher in those commodities. Assuming that Chinese industrial demand doesn't start coming off as there's been recent worries about, you know, about that. I remember it must have been about four or five years ago sitting having lunch with a mate of mine who's a stockbroker and he turned around to me and he said to me I reckon in two years time gold I mean uh, oil will be trading at over a hundred dollars a barrel and at that stage it was trading at about 40 odd and I said to him Bobby are you out of your skull a hundred dollars a barrel he phoned me about two years later <laughs> he said it's just gone through 101 yeah um, and you, it's likely to stay there. Are you, uh, you, you reckon it's going to stay up in those levels? Uh, I think it will. I think we're not seeing an increase in supply mm -hmm. that's keeping pace with the, the demand growth. And so that demand growth is going to keep e eating into stocks and supplies. We saw the U.S. trying to manipulate the oil price a bit by, by selling some of their reserves. But all they've done is created future demand when they want to build up their reserves again. Mm -hmm. So I think that that growth is outpacing supply at the moment. We go through these little economic lulls and, and, we, and the oil price comes off a bit, but something like Brent is going to stay above $100, uh, I think. 112, 115 average. Well, the next in a few years, some will run out of Brent. So, you know, that's, that's probably what's yeah. keeping prices high there. But uh, have we, have we st opened the taps properly on, on oil reserves in Nigeria and Angola and, and places like that? No, I think there, there, are, there are crude grades that come out of Angola and Nigeria. Nigeria obviously has problems every now and again with the, the, the rebels. Um, but I mean, obviously the Saudis are, the, are still the, the, the major force and OPEC is still the major driver in that market. Um, we do have enough oil and obviously as prices go higher, you tend to find more viable oil sources that are, but however, those are more expensive. So the marginal cost of production has been creeping up and we're probably at around $75 for, for new oil reserves, which is why you won't really see the oil price fall much below $75. And same with coal. You, you, you have a natural flaw and that keeps going higher and higher. Now, is it RMB that's just, that launched a, um, a coal index? That's right, yeah. yeah. So obviously there's, there's interest coming in from big institutions mm. as a result of investors wanting to get into oil and coal. How, how do you 
how do you invest your your well for our private clients we look at coal shares and obviously one big name that pops up is Exoro. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they've owned a little bit of uh, Kumba as well so they've got some iron ore exposure but by and large um, coal uh, so that's our exposure there for private clients uh, and then on the oil side you've got Sassel and you know we're making quite a good case for both of those shares at the moment if you like the underlying fundamentals of the commodity you think uh, the companies are going to increase production over time the commodity prices are going to go up and over time the rand's also going to weaken um, you've got all those three things working in your favor what, what I will say on that, on the, on the coal, it's an exchange traded note, so that's a share. And the, the exchange traded note tracks the underlying coal price, uh, which is the Richards Bay export price in, in, in dollars and then converted to rand. Um, but where you see a big difference between shares and something like this exchange traded note, it becomes quite dramatic because someone like an, an Exaro or Coal of Africa, they can't export as much coal as they, they want to at the moment because of rail constraints, because of port constraints. So the share won't necessarily benefit as much as they would like to from a rising coal price. You're seeing, you are seeing a rising coal price because India and China are having brownouts, etc., and the demand is, is, is certainly there. But our companies are constrained by rail and by port. So to, if you buy the ETN, you're getting unhindered access to that coal price in rands. And, and I think that is, it's, it, in fact, that, that ETN is the only place in the world where equity investors can get direct access to the underlying coal price. What is that ETN? I think it's just called the RMB Coal ETN. Okay. Yeah. So, and th that tracks the coal. The, the, it, the it, it tracks price. the API4 price, which is an index for coal, which trades out of Richards Bay. It's the, it's the front and the second month. It takes an average of the two months. So there's delivery issues around there. Why do you guys get all technical about this? <laughs> Why don't you just say this is the price of coal? It, it, it tracks the, the, the spot month of delivery in coal, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to you once again and say, just as in gold, your, what's your weighting? in oil and coal. Do you have any specific numbers? Do you look at it and say you need to be around 10% or whatever? Yeah, again, we look at the index. So what, what's the makeup of the index? And if we, if, we, if we bullish on that share or that commodity or that sector of the market, then we'll overweight the index. So something like Sassel, individual share, uh, makes up the whole index. It, there's only one big oil company, really. And uh, so we would, we, we would look to go a bit overweight there, and that's probably 5 6 7% as well. I mean, your portfolio in that one share. And uh, I think the coal component of the index is, is quite small, but uh, we wouldn't want to have anything less than 3%. So we'd probably have around 5% exposure on, on the, say, XRO slash coal side. So in other words, if you're looking at gold, coal and oil, you're looking at about 15% of your portfolio. Very much so. But if you look at the local market and the local makeup of the index, um, Anglos, Billiton, uh, all the resource companies make up a substantial amount of, uh, of the market capitalization of the, of the market here. So if you're going to have a local portfolio where you're looking to outperform that index, you're going to be quite heavily committed to resources. But that's a part of the market that we like at the moment anyway. Um, going forward though, are, are businesses and are governments not going to be looking at renewable sources of, of uh, of energy True. and I is that going to affect coal in the long run? Well yes and no, I mean you've got power stations that still have 20, 30 year lifespans. Um, Germany's just scrapped their nuclear stations so you know they are looking at re-extending re their, their, their coal stations. The coal is a base, so coal and nuclear are base load generation which you have to have to keep hospitals etc running. Wind power, wave power are really peak load generation and they only work when the wind's blowing or etc because you can't store electricity. Um, but of course you need all of that for an integrated grid and, and, and it becomes very difficult to manage the grid if you've only got something like wind power. And unfortunately, obviously, the, the, the capital cost of, of wind power at the moment is, is, is still quite high. So on a, on a per gigajoule basis, um, it, it's still fairly high, whereas coal at the moment is like, say, 15 South African cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, wind power might be more like 80 cents per kilowatt hour. But of course, as the capital cost comes down and the wind is free, that, that generation cost will, will come down, whereas coal generation costs are going to go up. So in the next five years, you'll probably see coal and wind power being the same. And, and, it, and it makes sense to try and look at locking in renewable power now, yeah. Um, going ahead, you still bullish on, on, on coal? You, 
Uh, is it going to drop down below the levels it is now? Or is it going to be like oil and just keep moving up? I think ultimately it is going to, to keep moving up. I mean, ongoing production, it's, it's easier to look for, for new coal resources um, than it is, say, for oil. But I think those prices will, will uh, have a substantial base and, and move, move higher over time. And as, as Bevan said, coal you're going to need, I think this is a decade story before we find real alternatives that are going to eat into the demand for coal. The problem with something like coal and oil is, is the good stuff is running mm. out. You know, you tend to mine the good stuff first and you get mm. decent money for that. Now you're paying the same price for much lower quality coal. Um, so it gives you a, a lower heating value. Um, and unfortunately what's happening is as we go down the quality curve, it becomes more and more strategic because industries like Eskom burn a low quality coal. Now India is burning virtually the same quality coal as Eskom is burning. And Indonesia is looking at putting export restrictions in place to ban exports of low quality coal. I'm sure the South African government, whether they look at nationalization issues or whether they look at banning exports as well, that will only drive the price sky high for countries like Germany and the UK and China who need our, our well China maybe not so much, but they need our coal. Mm. So the export price of coal is going to go sky high, but again if, if, if coal exports are banned, our local companies are not going to benefit from that. Are we, uh, do we need to start looking that way? I'd, I'd be hesitant to say because I, I, I would prefer to see a, a free market in place where people can come in and, and, and look for uh, resources um, and, and, and really grow that resource base. But you have a two-tiered market. You have a very high-priced export market and a, and a low-priced domestic market. And unfortunately, the returns in the domestic market are not really there to commit capital at the moment. So you have to have that export element for people to invest. But from a long-term security point of view, surely we should be looking at something like that. Absolutely. Uh, I think we are, and I think there are lots of initiatives to try and find alternative energy sources and independent energy sources. Companies like Sassel, okay, they burn their own gas, but they're creating their own electricity for a lot of their own use, so they're, not, uh, they're less reliant on Eskom. Companies like Tongart, they go and chop the sugar down and all the leftover bits they go and throw in a furnace and generate electricity. So there are quite a few initiatives um, on the go. 5% gold, 5% gold, coal, 5% oil. Well, look, I, I, don't, I don't trade shares at all. I would, I would, you know, I would, if I'm trading futures, it's 30% it's coal, 30% oil, and 30% food. I mean, food is the, other, is the other major commodity that you have to be bullish on because, um, again, you know, the, the, the soil is getting less and less able to produce every year, overuse of fertilizers, etc. growing population. I mean, that has to be... Uh, that could actually be uh, a very interesting show. Maybe we'll have to take a look at that uh, next week or, uh, or the week after. Is look at food and food security.